Very, very, very important part of the recording. Again, this better description of my job that I could ever hope to come up with. Um, OK, so yeah, um, without further ado, I will just start jumping in. For each of these partners, I'm going to go through them. Um, but I will leave like three seconds uh, pause at the end of each partner. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand at any point in time when I'm talking about these partners. Uh, and I will pause before moving on to the next one uh, to answer any questions that you have. So AutoCAD, uh, in my personal history, this was actually one of the first major partners. This was way back when I was just PMing for V8 and WebAssembly and Fugu was far away from even being a thing. Um, AutoCAD picked up WebAssembly on their own kind of proactively and were able to compile their 35-year-old code base, a code base that predates the web itself, and now running in Chrome. In 2017, we did an IO talk with them where they had a, about a quarter of the talk where they kind of talked about some of their journey. And you can find that on YouTube. Just Google like IO 2017 WebAssembly uh, and you'll find it along with me rambling at you for even more time because who doesn't want that after today? Um, some of the things that they proactively brought up is obviously file system and file handling are big on their list. Uh, again, just really trying to integrate more with the underlying operating system. Uh, and then also fonts is the other one that they proactively mentioned. Next up is Figma. This was also part of that same IO talk that I um, uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, Figma is a really great design application. If you haven't tried it, you really actually should because it's a really phenomenal example of an application that really leverages the powers of the web platform to provide a differentiated experience. Um, Figma actually made these slides for me. So this is their words, not mine. Um, but they identified in the marketplace a lot of challenges around you know, people having the right files and files being out of date across different people's machines and people like emailing files to each other to get feedback um, and just you know, having people having different operating systems or different applications installed uh, caused a lot of friction in actually being able to get feedback on your designs. And now they use the same kind of system that G Suite uses so effectively where they have the single link as the source of truth for a specific document. Everything is always up to date and accessible by anyone anywhere. Um, we did connect with them specifically on the topic of Fugu and talk about some of the capabilities that they want. They're a very tech-savvy group of people, uh, so they knew exactly what they wanted. Uh, they're also interested in local font access. Uh, they're also very invested in clipboard so that they can actually put the things on the clipboard that they want. Color Picker, I think they're the only one that I've heard so far that really wants this, but they want to be able to kind of test the pixel color value um, of anything on the screen is understandable from a designer application. Also file system and file handling, I'll probably just skip that because I think literally every partner wants that. Um, they also very interestingly want to launch external apps. There are some few other partners who want this. Um, today you can uh, open an application, I believe Word, uh, Office 365 has this functionality, where if you're looking at a document, you could click a button and then open it in the native application. But this requires cooperation between the website and the application. Uh, Figma is specifically interested in, say, let's say I have the native Photoshop application or something. They want to have a button on their site where I can click it and then pick Photoshop, the native application, and then open Photoshop with that file specifically. Uh, this isn't one that I think we've started tackling on Fugu yet, but I'm quite interested in it. And then another topic that we've explored for them uh, that we also haven't started active engineering on is tabbed application mode for desktop PWAs. Uh, Figma was kind of designed with the browser in mind, and so it's very common for Figma users to have multiple documents open as tabs. And Figma really likes that style, but they also do want to pursue a PWA, um, but then want to have those same kind of affordances. And then uh, similar to a few other, they'd like to be able to take the uh, PWA, and I actually thought this was hilarious, but we've heard it from a few partners now, and actually be able to offer a downloadable thing that people download into their download folder and then double click it. Uh, this is obviously more friction than just clicking the install button, um, but they were interested in offering this to their users because they knew that that's how users think about acquiring software today. Hopefully that's a mentality that will change over time, but I thought it was an interesting request. Yes. So with the launch external apps bullet point, you mentioned native. Did they also want to be able to launch external PWA apps? Yes, absolutely. Although I think that's a lower priority for them. Um, yeah. I think that's a lower priority for them at this point in time just because there are fewer installed PWAs in today's world. But this, if we built this, we would 100% need to also support opening PWAs. <sighs> Any other questions on Figma? 
VLC is one that is very new. Uh, I had the wonderful experience of trying of joining a uh, call with the president of VLC, being ready to like pitch them on trying to like come to the web and how they could use WebAssembly and all this stuff. And he's like, "Oh yeah, we've been working on this for like a couple months now." Um, which is always nice to hear from a partner <laughs> that you're ready to convince. But we ended up having a phenomenal conversation. Again, very tech savvy group of people. Uh, who know exactly the things that they need. They're quite interested in the web codex proposal, uh, as well as the audio device clients. Uh, and then they also had a bunch of WebAssembly requests, but this is a FUBU summit, so I won't go into too many of those. Uh, next up is SketchUp. We talked about this, uh, this partner in 2018 at I.O. for the desktop PWA talk by Paul Covell and Dominic Ng. Um, they also came to the web using WebAssembly, again, compiling a native application. Uh, their requests were for better printing. Interestingly, a lot of people take uh, SketchUp out to like build sites and things like that. Uh, and they were able to get offline support through Service Worker and were very happy with it, but still had some problems like being able to connect to printers and things like that. Uh, they're also interested in raw clipboard access. Questions, questions. Yes. Uh, Hmm. They do have some requests around some WebAssembly functionality, like more access to memory. I'm I'm curious to talk to you maybe later about what exactly was breaking. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't done an exploration of comparing their native app to their web app in terms of you know resource utilization, but that could be an interesting deep dive. It's a great app. You should all check it out. Questions? OK. Construct 3. Uh, this is a slightly lesser known application, but Construct uh, is a really great little game making studio. Uh, they use an interesting mix of both JavaScript and then WebAssembly, where they want extra performance like for their physics engines and things like that. Um, they were one of the very first adopters of desktop PWAs. I actually remember seeing a prompt in their UI to install. Uh, before desktop PWAs were actually shipped. Um, but they've been really on the forefront at adopting a lot of these things. Uh, one interesting thing about um, Construct 3 is that they really leverage the web's universality in their export pipeline. So they allow you, much like most game engines, to export to all kinds of different platforms, Android, iOS, et cetera. But on all of those platforms, it's effectively just a wrap web view um, that they then export using NWJS uh, and other frameworks for other platforms. They're interested in getting file system and file handling. Uh, they also want the ability to launch external programs. Uh, interestingly, they had a request to block extensions because they so they have an NWJS, which is basically the same as Electron uh, application as well. And they found that one of the advantages of that was that extensions didn't work. And a lot of extensions caused increase uh, RAM usage and lower performance. And so they actually found better performance with their kind of native wrapped applications just because of that. This is a very hard or hard um, API to really consider, because some extensions are for uh, accessibility of things and others. And so I don't have a current, current plan on how to offer this to them, but it's something that they want. Questions? OK. G Suite, unsurprisingly, is kind of invested in the web. Uh, who'd have thought? Um, this is obviously a very important partner to, uh, to Google uh, and is one of the main people that we support internally. Uh, they have a number of different requests. They want wake lock for slides so that you can be presenting without having a computer falling asleep. They're interested in the virtual keyboard API, scheduled notifications, also better printing. I believe today they do this weird thing when you want to go print where they actually go and like render some stuff on the server side and then serve you a bunch of like mismatched HTML that like fits the printing pipeline in Chrome and it's all weird. And then also window management, again, for slides when you have like a presentation window and another window and multiple screens going. It's very helpful. Questions? OK, rolling right along. Um, Citrix is a really interesting and somewhat unique application. Citrix is a kind of virtualized uh, workspace where they have you know, servers hosting Windows and whatnot and then lets you actually connect and use those applications. This is really useful as a bridging strategy for Chrome OS, and so it's a, Citrix is a top priority for Chrome OS. Um, they, 
We talked in the past about how Chrome is basically an application platform on top of an OS, which is also an application platform. Citrix is now an application platform sitting on top of Chrome, sitting on top of the OS. And so they have even deeper kind of requirements. Uh, they want to be able to you know, have full control of the keyboard so they can intercept all of the keyboard events fully, uh, you know, kind of being able to take up the entire screen real estate. Uh, they want to have minimal kind of, of our UI showing because they have their own windows and own UI within their uh, application showing. Uh, they have also a lot of interest in um, web transport and better kind of socket-based communication. Uh, but they are also in the unique position or relatively unique position of needing to have a socket connection to unconfigurable endpoints. As background, if you want to use WebSockets today, you have to actually configure the endpoint, server endpoint, to speak WebSockets. Um, but some of these servers that are hosting these workspaces are like in dormitories and like admins uh, don't have access to necessarily and just aren't configurable. And so they're one of the main reasons why we're exploring the uh, raw socket proposal. Questions? Um, Duo is um, obviously a video chatting application that on desktop form factors adopted PWAs as their primary solution. Uh, this is a public blog post, which is why I can share it, uh, about Google Duo using um, PWA uh, and really benefiting from it. Uh, in terms of wants, they're one of the main um, people asking for the ability to kind of pop your window to the front uh, at a certain you know, point, say when you're getting a call. Uh, this is one of those hard to design capabilities because there is obviously such a potential for misuse and abuse, uh, but we want to make sure that we can potentially offer that to them someday. Okay. Um, some of you might have heard about Flutter. Flutter is a um, development framework that lets you really create cross-platform applications. And uh, we have been engaging with their Hummingbird team uh, for the last year or so. And this is basically Flutter on the web. Uh, they very interestingly are going to pursue two different paths. They're going to pursue uh, one path where you basically end up exporting HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, and that takes uh, relatively little size. Um, so you can use that for actual like, web applications that you want to just use. But they're interestingly also pursuing a path of just compiling their engine down to WebAssembly and then giving that as an option to developers. Uh, the version that compiles to WebAssembly gives you much uh, fuller, rich uh, features and kind of is more precise because it's just painting to a canvas on the screen, so they really control every pixel, but has the downsides of being, I think, like two to three megabytes in size. And so not really as useful for your like drive-by web application, but if it's something that you expect your user to like install and they're okay with like waiting for a slow first load, then uh, that's a path that they're offering to developers as well. Uh, Spotify, this is entirely public information. This is stuff that we shared, I think, at Chrome Dev Summit, or I shared it actually at Google Cloud in a talk that I've got. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I should have paused. The one time I didn't pause. What, what do they use? What takes up the space? Uh, what is the huge thing about it? Is that a, a web runtime? It's, yeah, it's basically the same engine uh, that they have, which they ship on Android and iOS in those applications. It's basically just instead of taking that and running it you know, on Android and iOS, they run it compiled to WebAssembly. Gotcha. Yeah, and the size of like two to three megabytes isn't a problem <coughs> for um, native applications on mobile because you download it once and those kinds of size expectations are pretty normal. So um, by compiling to the web stuff, so HTML and CSS and stuff, it assumes that there's a browser. Yeah, they kind of uh, they tap into more of the browser-based functionality. So they just use your standard like CSS rules and JavaScript logic and JavaScript accessible APIs. Two to three megabytes sounds like an awfully slim browser runtime. Yeah, I think this was like gzip all the way and, and all that stuff. So OK. Yeah, and that was just their runtime bit of it. I think they do still like tie into various API access points and whatnot. Cool. All right, rolling right along. Partner Marathon. Uh, Spotify. Uh, so these slides are from a talk that I gave at Google Cloud Next, uh, which you can find. I think it's called Unlocking Value for Your Users on Chrome. At Google Cloud Next, you can YouTube it. Um, Spotify had two interesting challenges uh, when they were pursuing a mobile uh, PWA. 
they wanted to make sure that when users were in like Facebook or some other thing or somebody sent them a link to a song, uh, that that user could just click on that link and very easily try to just listen to the song even if they weren't a Spotify user or if they didn't have the actual application installed. Spotify also wanted to provide a uh, lighter experience uh, for some of the emerging markets where phone um, storage capacity is a major blocker to actually adopting some of these applications. Uh, and so, for example, they saw users in Brazil with one less than one gigabyte free space uh, on their phones, since they wanted to provide a really slim version, which they were able to do through the PWA. Uh, their approach was fairly interesting. They started real, very small. And so they allowed visitors to play one track before having to download the native app. And they used kind of A-B testing um, to see how engaged users of the installed PWA were compared to people who had kind of downloaded the native application, how many more people were actually willing to. And the results were pretty great, actually, um, far better than even Spotify or ourselves expected. They saw a 54% increase in day one plays, which is their primary activation metric, which is a huge increase in your primary metric. Um, they saw 14% uh, in 60-day active users, so you know increased retention uh, because people weren't uninstalling the application to get space back. And they saw 30% um, of logins from churned users, so 30% of people who had left were now able to come back through this much slimmer version. Again, these are big numbers for a like, major application like Spotify. Uh, next up is Starbucks. Again, tried to pursue a uh, mobile application. Um, they had two challenges, UX parity, making sure that the mobile app uh, was reliable, engaging, um, and that the PWA was as reliable and engaging. And then also storage, again, users um, in various emerging markets just did not have a lot of space. Their approach was really to focus on performance first, really making sure that their code size was very slim, making sure that they were caching everything using service worker for offline, doing image optimizations, all of those like standard things. Um, and then also, you know, adding on top of that basic performance layer with really delightful UX, being able to add to home screen, better sign-in and credential management through Chrome APIs, helpful animations, accessibility, et cetera. They really focus on all of these like basic essentials. Um, also, huge results for Starbucks PWA. They saw two times faster uh, to interactivity after they uh, pursued this new new approach. So twice as fast to load, sixty-five percent. What did I do? Okay. 65% increase uh, in Starbucks rewards registrations uh, through the web app, and 25% of orders placed through Starbucks uh, PWA actually they found came on desktop. And so they found that when they um, actually invested in a really great UX experience on mobile, uh, even without really thinking that much about desktop, they found that a bunch of users were actually coming directly to desktop. Uber was another one that I heard. Again, this is all public information, but I don't have a slide on it. Uh, they found something very similar. This shocked me, but it was something like 20% of Uber rides um, in various different regions ended up being actually called from a desktop-based form factor. Uh, and they found that they were able to like invest in you know mobile web and do a PWA. And then shockingly, that just you know transferred over to uh, desktop. And now desktop users were suddenly able to access. When you uh, say PWA, was it installed like at least for Starbucks through add to home screen? I believe, yes, they didn't do a TWA. And what is the, um, do we have an idea of how easy it is or how often people do it? Um, I imagine Starbucks does. I don't personally have that information right now. And if I did, I probably couldn't tell you. Yeah. Is there any, um... Did anybody express interest in replacing their native mobile apps entirely? I, of the uh, mobile partners, not extensively. Definitely on the um, desktop partners, I think that there was much broader interest. Duo, for example, only ended up doing a uh, PWA. We actually had a conversation with them where they were planning to do um, uh, a native application, but we were able to convince them uh, that they could do just a web app. And one more story as a tool, which is a pretty big uh, TV application. They had a native app and they launched their PWA and replaced it entirely. Um, so yeah, they have an amazing um, five-star rating experience now. So pretty good.
to add one more example there, uh, 1-800-Flowers uh, mm. is a massive US company. And for Mother's Day in May, they actually uh, shipped their um, they actually shipped their TWA experience uh, as their prime app. And uh, they found that their conversions went up. Yeah, I know. I remember hearing that story. It was very impressive metrics. Josh. So obviously for these companies that have launched PWAs, uh, I wouldn't call them needs, but are there capability requests from either of these? Uh, from Spotify. specific which ones? Oh, Starbucks the two Spotify. mobile ones. Yeah. Um, I didn't personally engage with them as deeply, I believe, unless somebody's about to correct me, maybe Peter. Um, they have most of what they need in the platform. Uh, these two specific partners, Alex, you might know some of their requests as well. Sorry, I only personally engage with the desktop partners. Sorry, so um, we've we've been working with Starbucks for years now, and um, they have presented it at various places and talked about what they want and need. Um, barcode scanning was a was a request. I don't know if it's actually made it into their product, but that's something that um, is helpful in sales environments. Uh, there was a, at some point a conversation around NFC, but I don't think that's that's followed through. Um, and uh, with regards to, sorry, what was the second one? Um, um, you mean Spotify? Spotify. Yeah. Um, Spotify is a media company, and their needs look very similar to the rest of the media ecosystem, um, where they're doing protected playback, and offline protected playback is a constant challenge. And so there's a series of requests from multiple partners in that area that all have the same f essential flavor. Um, uh, but uh, you can imagine that access to more storage uh, has been important for almost all of those partners, and Spotify is no different. Mm -hmm. Which we rolled out a few days ago. Go, Jared. Um, all right, moving right along. Uh, quick oh, question. question, please. Yes. Yeah. I'm wondering if uh, Spotify has um, talked with us at all about um, media keys on the keyboard for desktop and integration in that regard? Uh, some of this might not be entirely shareable, or at least I have not gotten permission from Spotify. Desktop media this. keys are launched, right? So yeah. um, for Chrome, they are launched. And if you use the Spotify application on desktop, you will see that it works. Yep. So that's, that's observable by <laughs> inspection. Cool. Uh, that is, I believe, it for the actual uh, partners that I was going to cover. Um, I know that Microsoft has their own little segment, but maybe before we join there, any final questions? Any partner that you wasn't mentioned that you want to hear about, Alex? Um, it, a meta question. Uh, what is the process by which uh, we, Google, um, tend to qualify and then do outreach and then decide to work with um, a particular team or partner or group, um, given that uh, these all seem to be relatively large companies. I mean, even the startups are folks who I think most folks here have heard of. Yeah. I think in general, it comes from one of two directions. Either we as a, a team, myself included, and our business development unit, uh, Anshul being the main part of contact there, for those of you who know her, um, we kind of sit together with Alex and the other leads uh, and try to work, work through um, what partners we want to see come to the ecosystem. Uh, for all the Googlers, I do have a presentation called Vision for Desktop uh, Web Apps that has all of this information and all of the specific partners that we're trying to target. Uh, happy to share that out internally. Apologies, Microsoft and Intel. Uh, and then, so that's kind of one direction, us deciding that we want to engage with them. And then usually, we like make the decision, and then we try to find a point of contact. Google's a large company, so we kind of look internally to see if anybody has any existing relationships, and then try and leverage those. Or sometimes just cold emailing people being like, hey, are you interested? Do you want to come talk to us? And most of the times, uh, they're interested in at least getting a meeting. That being said, some of our capacity for actually doing this outreach is somewhat limited, not so much by the resources on our side, just that um, Google apparently has a bit of a reputation of over-communicating to partners. And so sometimes it can be hard to actually get in touch with them, and sometimes if these large companies have an existing like business management person that's for that company, then you have to go through them. Sometimes you have to prioritize your requests uh, against all other requests from all other teams at Google. 
So that can be a bit of a bottleneck in that community channel. But then that's going in one direction, uh, us deciding to reach out. Uh, for a lot of these partners, I would say actually the majority of these partners, uh, they basically came to us or they decided to invest in the web uh, and then we find out about them. And then we went and said like, hey, you're building cool stuff. Can we help? And they're, they're usually very eager to chat. This is the case for both AutoCAD, Figma. Um, what was the other one? AutoCAD, Figma. Construct and SketchUp. These were all applications that actually launched, and then we found out about them, and we're like, "Wow, this is super cool!" Um, and then we were able to engage with them, and that's a really nice way of forming relationships because then you're coming to them uh, and actually helping them proactively rather than asking something of them. Other questions about just like partners, how we do things? Yeah, Sam. You said that um, you uh, look more closely to the desktop partners than the mobile ones. Yeah, myself, personally. That's because we have uh, PJ McCaughlin, who is the uh, PM for mobile PWAs. Oh, and perfect. he oversees our mobile. This is not to say that mobile is any less important than desktop. That's just my area of expertise. Perfect. That, that answered both of my questions. <laughs> uh, who, who is, who is, who is who's the, the, the mobile version of PWAs? And uh, it's, you seem to be implying that these are equally, equally yes, important. Yes, 100%. I yeah. mean, I, I think the, the battlegrounds on desktop and mobile are very different, and we face very different challenges on each of those. Um, in some ways, that mobile is more important, in my opinion. OK. Namrata. Um, Sam. Uh, just following up on what you just said, like, can you elaborate on the battlegrounds that you see are very different for mobile PWAs and desktop PWAs? Sorry, I missed the first part of your sentence. Uh, can like I elaborate? You just mentioned, yeah, you, can you elaborate on, like, you said there are different battlegrounds for mobile PWAs and desktop PWAs, and there seems to be a theme yeah. in uh, most of the partners in terms of, like, wants on desktop and, like, wants on mobile, yeah. and what's holding people back on each platform. I, uh, I covered a little bit of this in my earlier presentation about how desktop and mobile differs. Definitely a big component of it is what I mentioned earlier about just the acquisition channel that people go through. Desktop, um, so I recently heard this from Intel, and I was told that it is public information, so I will repeat it here and say that apparently upwards of 50% of all Intel CPU cycles are spent executing Chrome, which is interesting and terrifying in a lot of ways. Chromium, yes, sorry. But this is to say that on desktop, the web really is kind of like the de facto platform. And when trying to build an application for the web, the kind of standard go-to solution is web or Electron in some way. Uh, this is very much not the case on mobile. Um, I think on mobile and uh, Android and iOS, the native apps are by far the much more common case scenario. Um, and this makes the web story much harder, but I think also therefore much more important. Um, I think. Mobile is a place where we face a lot of challenges, but it's an incredibly important space. It is the next wave of computing, whereas desktop is incredibly important uh, as well. But we are in a much more secure position, and I think the possibility of us having a complete ecosystem impact is much higher. These are my personal opinions. Yes. What do uh, partners complain more about, performance or capability mismatch? Um, so I only have the perspective that I get on this. And so most of the partners that I talk to talk more about capabilities. I think performance becomes a lot more important on mobile. I think there's also a differentiation between mobile uh, or between loading performance and actually like runtime execution performance. In general, I don't think I've heard that many complaints about execution performance. Uh, in general, unless it's around like web sockets, a few partners like Citrix have mentioned that. Um, but yeah, in the desktop form factor, again, where I spend most of my time, I'd say performance is not a major concern, and it's much more about the capabilities. Cool, this has been really good. Please uh, come talk to me if you have more questions about partners, how we manage things. I have like documents and slides and decks that I will just throw your way. Um, and always happy to continue to chat. But without further ado, I will hand it over to Microsoft. Are you okay with recording for the stuff you have?
Is that think it's fine? Because I just heard from uh, our customers who uh, are kind of happy for me to just call out their names. And for the other, like, uh, a well, number of customers uh, from Microsoft. I just uh, well talk about like generally web apps. If you can share more by not recording, you should not record. No, I think there's just customers that we haven't gotten new. So similar yes. to you, there's a few that we can talk about in detail, yes. and then there's a lot where we'll say we've had a partner ask for this thing, right. and we can't tell you who or the details of why they want it. Hey, Thomas, can you disconnect and see if that kicks this? <laughs> All right. <laughs> as much as we like looking at your ass. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Jong Gi Song uh, from Microsoft Edge team. I'm a program manager, uh, pronouns he, him. So uh, Lindsay and I are going to talk about uh, capabilities and some of our like findings from uh, talking from talking from talking with our like, like partners and uh, customers. So uh, it's an ongoing efforts currently. So we uh, come to uh, those like Microsoft properties and talk about things uh, who actually make their web apps on the web, uh, who also has like native apps mostly. And also uh, our uh, developer experience team is reaching out to a number of third party customers as well. So they talk about uh, what, uh, what, are, what are the missing capabilities and also uh, like uh, development experience, also like performance aspects of it. So we uh, <clears throat> hear a lot of uh, feedback from them. And as I said, uh, it's kind of ongoing efforts currently. So I sh uh, uh, Lindsay and I will share uh, some of the uh, aspects that we already heard. So our priority is basically some demonstrated needs from those customers. And uh, also, we are focusing on desktop and Windows currently. <laughs> so we are happy to uh, just explore this space uh, in that aspect. Uh, and also, we are definitely uh, well committed to be a good citizen in the Chromium project. So as a whole, like uh, we will, we are really happy to prioritize our like items uh, being heard from customers and uh, work on those uh, items in Chromium project uh, with certain priority. So here's uh, some of the list of items that we heard. So VS Code and uh, Outlook Online are uh, our internal customers who are happy uh, for me to call out their names. They already, uh, I mean, VS Code already uh, talked about their uh, path toward PWAs in Microsoft Build this year. So uh, they talked about uh, custom dialogue on closing a window. So comparing to what we what uh, the web developers have already, like uh, before onload, so it basically uh, pops up uh, browser UX to uh, ask about whether uh, the user really wants to close. But uh, what those application actually wants to do is to customize show and co show a customized dialogue where they can ask their users uh, with their own context. So for example, I've uh, tried the uh, Gmail uh, on the web. And uh, while I'm uh, typing th something, editing uh, on email and just close the window, then it actually uh, by default just uh, close the window and save the draft in the draft folder. Uh, that is uh, a default behavior. But for like Outlook native apps, they uh, shows a pop-up and explicitly ask uh, whether uh, it has like a three buttons, yes, no, and cancel. So they kind of want to uh, enable that experience on the web. So uh, this was an idea uh, heard from those two customers. And the next one is, uh, any questions? Please just uh, feel free to interrupt and ask questions about those asks. So the next one is uh, get installed related apps. So this one is already uh, being worked on for mobile. 
but we also uh, heard this uh, ask from Outlook Online and other apps. So uh, desktop apps at Microsoft and probably uh, some other third-party apps as well uh, wants to uh, know whether there are any corresponding native apps already installed in the OS so that they can uh, customize their like um, indication of uh, installation of those uh, native apps, corresponding native apps, or uh, kind of like whether to show or not show those uh, options. So there was uh, another uh, ask from the desktop as well. And the next thing is uh, leveraging OS identity uh, login information. So this idea is about uh, allowing a web application to just get the token of uh, OS login. So if the user is already logged in with uh, their OS identity, then a uh, number of apps actually wants to make that user automatically log in uh, for the application as well. So this, I think, uh, is not only like Windows, but across other uh, OS platforms and uh, related applications. So Lindsay, it's oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so the first one is uninstall, which we showed this morning, basically just having a more reasonable uninstall experience that feels um, typical of Windows applications. The next one was customizing title bar. So um, if you're using like Outlook today, there's a search bar in the title bar. And if they want to replicate that for their Outlook web app, they can't today um, because the title bar is something that's predefined. Um, the app icon shortcut menu is the jump list thing that John and I were showing this morning. So being able to customize which files, for example, show up there, um, or like I showed with Teams, being able to launch directly into a chat. Um, PWA pinning to the dock. This one's interesting because um, a lot of developers want the ability to auto install into like our taskbar. Um, something, it's something that on Windows, a lot of the time we don't actually want apps to do because it's not really honoring user preference, but obviously developers really want to do it. So it's one where we need to figure out the right policy and how we do the right thing. Um, windowing is an interesting one. Um, as I think we've talked about a few times, um, being able to have not only multiple windows, but precisely positioned on different screens. One of the particular, I think there's an enterprise slide later, uh, but one of the examples I have from back being on like the Windows teams and talking to a bunch of enterprises about why they picked Electron, it was because they wanted to be able to position a bunch of windows on a bunch of monitors, but then do things like update the app overnight. And when the trader got back to their desk in the morning, everything was in the exact same spot um, as the night before, and they don't even know the app is updated. So not just being able to do windowing, but persistent state, things like that. Then the last one is SysTray integration, which is um, kind of a Windows paradigm where on the taskbar, there's like a little uh, arrow thing over near the clock where when you push it, there's like small icons that pop up and they'll usually they're media apps or like Bluetooth connectivity or things like that. But there are some apps that only manifest there, not in the taskbar. And those APIs are currently limited to Win32 native applications, not even like UWP apps. Um, I don't know if the slide comes next, if it's really yeah, So uh, the next one is about some platform capabilities. So uh, we heard from uh, Free Code and others about uh, some additional capabilities uh, around file system. So they talked about uh, needs to uh, gather some metadata, file system metadata. Uh, for example, creation time and whether uh, selected file notice uh, like folder or or uh, like file that was uh, something I heard and also uh, about file change event so for example like uh, some multiple PWAs are uh, opened and one of the instance uh, instances updated a file save the file then uh, it uh, they actually wants to Get it up. I mean, no, notified in the in the other like PWAs. So file change event is another one. So we probably uh, have some chance to talk about it in uh, our like a TPAC YCG meeting as a uh, agenda topic. I think so. We uh, wants to talk about this, and also the next one is about service workers. 
Uh, this one is also uh, heard from VS Code. So they have some extension capability. So they provide extensions to ex extension developers so that they can render uh, their own HTML uh, content in you know, like a sandbox uh, iframe. So uh, uh, the issue is that uh, service workers basically uh, cannot be running on a, a like a unique opaque origin so how service workers uh, work for like iframe context is that iframe client uh, basically inherit parents service worker whenever they uh, inherit parents origin but uh, when it comes to like sandbox context or uh, something like uh, initial document context where uh, there's no uh, actual origin then uh, there's no service work, active service worker bound to that client. client. So uh, VS Code wanted to, they actually uh, filed a, an issue to service worker GitHub repository. So uh, I probably will uh, put this in the service worker meeting agenda next, uh, at TPEC next week. Uh, so basically the idea is to allow uh, unique origin register service worker for its own lifetime. So maybe service worker uh, just has to go away when uh, the tab is closed. But yeah, this is certainly uh, asked from VS Code to uh, implement their, their uh, I mean, current feature as like a PWA. And the multi-screen uh, capability as what we just mentioned, Lindsay just mentioned. And I just found that there's like a uh, open opportunity uh, between like, uh, like Chrome's uh, proposal and our proposal can collaborate. So uh, like our, some of the folks from our team actually uh, will be at TPET next week. So uh, we can just talk about uh, like screen enumeration, windows placement, and this multi-screen features. Mm -hmm. And the next thing is, uh, actually Alex just uh, mentioned the, the Starbucks, uh, I mean, ask, and I want to add it to that. So uh, we met Starbucks and they uh, wants to bring some like a screen brightness API for their barcode scanning so that uh, the user uh, doesn't have to actually uh, go to like settings and adjust the brightness of the screen every time they uh, use barcode. And they, uh, well, they, they were very happy for us to uh, call out this uh, feature ask in the community. So I think this is some of the ones that we can talk about. And we also heard from Outlook web app about limited, unlimited storage permission for their, like when they move to offline first uh, experience, then uh, this one is absolutely they want to have. And Lindsay, do you wanna? Yeah, so for the device capabilities, these are from a variety of different partners, but just some common themes we heard. Um, so. The first one is just better support for certain uh, device capabilities when available. And this maybe falls in the category of being something interesting to talk about in the breakout where installed PWAs maybe can learn more about the device capabilities than um, a PWA running in the browser. Um, the second one is being able to query for certain capabilities, like for hardware DRM capable devices, certain media apps will give higher quality content because they're more confident about the uh, protection of the content. Um, resolution display information so that they can figure out how to, you know, um, pick the right quality content video. And then output capabilities where media is saved, um, the ability to save to removable media. So if you are trying to save content offline, being able to do so to like a plugged in USB drive or something. Um, being able to query for available disk space and knowing if you're running out of disk space. So if you think of the scenario where you're downloading a bunch of offline media and you know, an app will prompt you that like, hey, you're about to run out of space, please delete stuff, things like that. Um, and then lastly, we've talked a little bit about wake lock, but this is sort of the other angle of screen is off, but I wanna keep playing audio and keep something running in the background, but not use the resources to keep the display itself on. Um, so yeah, just different capabilities. 
capabilities? Oh, um, yeah. So in more so security than privacy, content protection is one that's come up a few times. So blocking capture of protected content is a pretty common thing for our native applications where like if you hit print screen, there'll be a black box over an email that has information rights management on it. And there's not a comparable web thing today that um, we've been able to have those partners use. Uh, so like, I guess a good example is Outlook if you open the desktop app and screenshot it versus their web app. Um, similarly, we talked about uh, hardware DRM on the slide before, but basically this is where there's actual rights management built into the hardware itself. And this is something that a lot of native apps take advantage of, especially if they have like 4K media. Um, then is that, that's the only thing on slide. Yeah, the other enterprise one was the windowing stuff that we talked about and figuring out deployment. So this is pretty much we have today. So uh, the next step uh, should be like, we talk about uh, well, discuss around this feature request and then uh, prioritize uh, in the like uh, feature tracker in Fugu project together. So uh, any question? I'm curious about uh, for common partners, what the interaction is like. Are you uh, speaking with partners independently or together? And if independently, at what point do you sync up? Actually, we haven't really sync up uh, between uh, like Chrome team and our team. So, for example, I uh, just saw Thomas talked with like Starbucks and uh, some customers, but I think it was kind of individual uh, efforts. And uh, we also just reach out to those customers uh, well regularly or uh, based on some other issues to talk about. For example. Uh, to help out their development and things like that. And while talking with them, we just get uh, ask and get some idea of what they are, uh, what they, what is kind of missing capabilities they have. But we didn't really uh, talk much between us. It's a good call out that maybe we should for places that we are both able to talk about publicly that we're talking to the same person. So. Any other questions or comments? Issue? Feature request from me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Microsoft Teams is really an awesome product. We have been using it and amazing. But mm -hmm. if you are using through browser, even Edge, your uh, Edge Canary, whatever. Uh, still, um, get user media does not work. Uh, I, I mean, camera. If you can't do video call, uh, you need to fix that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not very. I, I, it's uh, not very easy. It works on Chrome. So yeah, thank, thank you very much. And I take that as my action item to talk with uh, Teams. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another. Question I might ask is because I don't know where I'll get Google and Microsoft together again. Uh, <laughs> uh, hardware DRM for high quality media. I saw the patch from Microsoft, the 10,000 line patch. It was amazing. Uh, uh, Microsoft uses Play. I don't know whether it's the correct place. Microsoft uses Play, play Ready and Google Wide Wine. How do you want now that? Edge is going to use Chromium. So by default, white wine, how do you want to you know, sync up that? It's a hard question. Sorry. It's a good question, but I don't know the answer. So I'm happy to take the question and figure out Google and Microsoft. Yeah. What's the best way to get uh, high resolution uh, feature requests, especially like for a file system? You mentioned some things about metadata. Uh, you would like to iterate on on the feedback, and uh, you know, no more. And in in your mind, how could we best do that? Absolutely, I think. But uh, I myself actually didn't really look uh, much deep into uh, the feature itself. But I just started uh, hearing those requests from uh, our customers. And definitely uh, want to iterate. And uh, currently, what I heard was uh, just those information. But as you said, uh, maybe I, yeah, need to just bring that. I mean, those aspects to the customer 
back to customer and just uh, talk about whether they need any uh, more information. And also, this was just from a uh, well, set of customers, but not really from wider general customer uh, base. So maybe while uh, talk with more customers, I keep just bring this topic and gather more information. And Alex. Sorry, I'm sure other folks have questions. Oh, but I just was curious about the um, information uh, management uh, restrictions. So to what extent uh, do you think that that's a restriction that only needs to be in place for enterprise managed profiles or devices? Or is that something where um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we could avoid um, the public drubbing that will come from an ex expansion of DRM capabilities to the web uh, while still meeting customer needs. And I'm trying to like understand um, from you if that is something that it tends to be situated in a place where administrators have control, um, or is that something where they're really worried about um, users who log in from a personal device that has no administrative policy applied even through the profile of the browser? Yeah. Um, so to be honest, it's not one that um, we've talked to a super extensive list of people about. Uh, the easiest thing I think is I can talk a little bit about how it's used today in native apps maybe. Um, and so today when it's used in native apps, it's totally an app decision that's unrelated to it being enterprise or enterprise users. It just so happens that the primary user of this in like the native case are is email clients and other like, um, you know, office apps that have protected content when they open up. So internally, that is like why we built the native API, whatever, five or 10 years ago. Um, and then every once in a while, there's a consumer app that does it where they'll like say that this photo is like protected IP and you can't screenshot it or something. But uh, yeah, exactly. Like Snapchat does things like that. Obviously on desktop, there's not really a Snapchat experience um, that is as applicable. But um, yeah, most of the cases are like the way it was exposed um, in native apps was literally a bit on a window where you just say like this window is protected or not. And an app will toggle it based on the actual content in the window at that point in time. Um, and so, yeah, I guess... But again, I would say there's kind of two main buckets. One is media, video type stuff. But again, for most apps, that's moving more towards hardware DRM than uh, other than the Snapchat case. And then there's the other side of I have company protected information, which could arguably be solved through more of an enterprise um, policy of some sort where that bit only applies on enterprise devices or something. Yeah. Okay. So hey. that's it. Yep. If you're all done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. And I guess that's the end of our agenda for today. Uh, I, I'm just inspired by uh, hearing from Microsoft's internal partners to give a slight little bit of a history lesson. Um, you know, the current hotness for developing a, or the current buzzword for developing a, you know, modern web app is PWA. Um, prior to that, it was HTML5, embrace HTML5. Uh, you go back even farther and it was Ajax. Um, if you pull that apart, asynchronous JavaScript and XML um, derives from this little thing, an API that we all adore and love, XML HTTP request, uh, which, got its beginning, please correct me if I say anything wrong, as a uh, COM interface on Windows uh, exposed via ActiveX built uh, by the Outlook Web Access team. So we can thank the modern web, <laughs> <laughs> or we can thank OWA um, and requesting new capabilities and, and building them for the web. Uh, we can thank that for everything we've done since then, the modern web, the existence of Google, all of that. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's. Just emphasize that. I think it's. I think it's. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to step on your toes with anything. I just. I just think that regardless of Outlook or G Suite or whatever, I think it's super important to emphasize that as we're building these capabilities for PWA, we are looking at the, the end user scenario, 
more than anything else. And that's why OWA invented XHR, uh, because they needed that end user scenario. Like that's what end users were asking for. And so they had to invent a way to do that. And taking that perspective first, instead of what we think is right first, is something I'm really excited about. When, when I asked, said what I was excited about earlier, it's really that at Microsoft anyway, we pivoted and said, we are just going to talk to customers and see what they want and build what they want. And it just happens to be PWA stuff right now. Thank you. OK, uh, let's see, logistics. Um, so we've got this room. Um, we have to be out of here by 1.30, uh, but no reason not to end early. Um, agenda for tomorrow. I don't have my laptop, so let me pull it up here. OK. Uh, reminder that uh, we do not have the room until 9.30 tomorrow, so starting a little bit later. Um, uh, Olivier, are we going to be downstairs at 8 o'clock again to be able to hand out the building stickers? Yes. Yes. OK. Um, yeah, wants to wake up late, we can also yeah. <laughs> 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 Let's say, you know, 8.30. OK, we'll, up, we'll update the, the agenda doc. Um, OK, and then we start off uh, tomorrow morning discussing remaining API priorities. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful hearing um, all of the partner requests today and how many of them we have in flight. Um, you know, also several we haven't even started yet. Um, and uh, break, um, I uh, will then put Namrata on the spot to talk a little bit about the UX process that we have. She's nodding, so this is not a total surprise at least. Um, and then we've got uh, the rest of the day, um, we've got set aside for um, brainstorming or breakout sessions. Um, although I did want to check, Alex, have we heard from the tag folks about a get together yet? Okay, so at some point tomorrow, could be a surprise with no notice, um, we'd like to get together with uh, folks from the tag because um, we got common interests. We want them to review our stuff. Um, and uh, But otherwise, we've got um, breakout sessions. And the way we're uh, planning that, please, uh, between now and tomorrow morning, add breakout session ideas onto the agenda, um, just line item linked to some context or a comment about context. And then tomorrow morning, we can do a little agenda bashing for that and figure out, are we doing it in one track? Are we going to break into smaller groups, um, upvote, downvote? We'll unconference the thing. OK, any other logistics before we break for today? Uh, again, I think various people are going out and doing uh, social activities. Um, Please send out invites to folks on the Slack channel. And then we've got Vince here with a comment and Daniel back there with a comment. I go first in. Uh, yeah, you can repeat my question. Uh, how do we create the breakout sessions? How do we create breakout sessions? How do we create the breakout sessions? Um, add your idea for the breakout session to the agenda doc, um, which you can edit if you've got a chromium.org account. If not, email me. I'll add it. And then tomorrow, again, we'll unconference it and figure out what we're actually talking about. I'm not sure how many people are using using Slack, especially the non-Googlers. Um, I would love to increase socialization between the companies. And um, one of the nice options, one of the only options I saw proposed so far for social activity was to go to see a TeamLab uh, art installation exhibit, sort of a modern very digital art installation exhibit. Um, need to pull tickets uh, ahead of time, probably, and then kind of coordinate um, when we're heading over there. I did confirm it looks like tickets are still available for today if you want to go. Um, and then there's some transit logistics, and we have to go check it out. I think it closes at 7 PM. Yeah, so we can figure that out. Um, what I didn't know is I haven't seen a lot of activity on Slack. So actually, I want to do a, a quick check. Like, put your hands up, everybody. Everybody who's here, hands are up. <laughs> okay, everybody who's been looking at Slack today, keep your hands up. Okay, so some people, <clears throat> not everyone. So I think that's, excuse me. <clears throat> so I think, you know, Slack is, is one tool. It, it works cross company, but it's clearly not something that, we're, you know, we're getting everybody in on. So I think it, it makes sense to like just speak up in person. Um, so I like this idea. Let's figure out a time. People who want to go to this, let's just, you know, we're all here physically. Let's just talk and, and sort that out. Um, Jared. What is the name of the Slack channel? 
Oh, bother. Yeah. 